and welcome to another bonus episode of the underworld podcast i'm your host sean williams coming to you from new zealand and joining me on the pod today is karim zidane a journalist and editor of the bloody elbow which is a great site that covers the weird and wonderful world of mixed martial arts or mma and while we would probably get far more of rogan's listeners coming over to us if we did previews of upcoming ufc fights and to be honest i don't mind the old bit of fight banter myself We're going to focus on something Kareem's been reporting on for years now, uh, and I think it's fair to say he's the global authority on this. It's the long-time and deepening connections between MMA and Chechen dictator, warlord, gangster, star of Instagram, Ramzan Kadyrov. And if you don't think that's a problem, first of all, and it's just sport and sports and politics don't mix, yada, 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 it's probably best just to switch this one off. But um, we can get into some of Kadyrov's crimes in a bit. But first, uh, Kareem, welcome to the show, first of all, and uh, tell us a little bit more about how you kind of got involved in this, what seems a, a niche subject at first, but it just explodes into all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh, goodness me. I think uh, in order to answer that question, we really have to go straight back to uh, sort of the genesis of, of my career in journalism, because to be honest with you, most people tend to ask me why did I choose to focus on a niche such as the intersection of sports and politics. And the answer is very simple, really. I come from Egypt. I come from a country that you know has been under a military dictatorship for many, many decades now. Uh, Politics infiltrates every aspect of society and of my life. That's just something I have grown up to accept. And truth be told, it's something that, you know, Western countries are very privileged in, in the fact that they can separate politics from a lot of aspects of their life. You know, if you're, uh, if you're living quite a comfortable existence, you don't really have to worry, and politics doesn't impact your everyday life. Policies and changes don't necessarily impact your everyday life. While in Egypt, you can see it seep into every aspect of life, and sports was no different. I mean, I grew up watching, you know, uh, soccer and football in in Cairo and in this massive Cairo stadium that can take up to like 100,000 people. And those stadiums used to really fill up for a lot of those games. And I was a big supporter of the Al Ahli team, which is, you know, Egypt's uh, most dominant uh, football club. Yeah. And they had supporters known as the Ultras. And the Ultras started in around 2007 in Egypt. And the Ultras are these hardcore football fan group, uh, like fan groups. And in a lot of Western countries, they end up becoming sort of these fascist entities. In the Arab world and in Egypt, they became uh, the exact opposite, actually. They were anti-fascists and revolutionaries. And these ultra groups were well known for, you know, taking aim not at other hooligans or other football fans. There was a lot, there was a lot less of that sort of, you know, team on team uh, hooligan fighting. And instead, it was always targeted at the government. This was the way the youth expressed themselves. They expressed themselves uh, as, a, as, a, as a unified voice during football games and, and after football games as well. And when there were clashes, the clashes were always between those supporters and the police. That is just the standard way it was, and this continued through into the revolution. They were a essential and pivotal aspect of the Egyptian revolution, because had it not been for the ultras who already knew how to fight with the police and to take part in street fights, uh, a lot of the protesters who were out there for the first time would have suffered a lot more, let's just put it that way. So this intersection between sports and politics is simply something we call life in Egypt. There's no avoiding it. And this mentality, you know, followed me throughout the rest of my life when I decided to pursue journalism and sports journalism in particular. Well, it was never a question really whether I was going to include the aspect of sport, of, of politics, you know, society, economics, all of that was always going to factor in. So really, when you ask me, where did this begin? I'd say right at the beginning. The fact that I was born in Egypt basically set me down this course, uh, you know, long before I ever intended to go down it. Yeah, I, I think we've we've kind of spoken to some people in the past about the the ultras around Europe and the Middle East and and what happened at Port Said as well. Obviously, a huge disaster that was all tied into the the revolution at the time. Um, so, how did you get from there to MMA, and what first kind of you know pricked your ears up about that sport and its and its links to politics then? 
Well, I didn't really uh, take notice of mixed martial arts at all until I moved to Canada to study in university. So I moved to Toronto to study at the University of Toronto. And some of my roommates were really into it. So on Saturday nights, they'd show me these UFC events. And at first, I'm like, what is this? Is this supposed to be like just, you know, WWE, but more violent? Like, that's honestly how, how ignorant I was of it at the time. But... Uh, after a while, I just I couldn't help but get really into it. I thought I thought it was just a fascinating uh, sport overall. And I thought, you know what, if I'm going to start as a journalist, and truth be told, journalism was never this, you know, massive obsession or ambition of mine. I'm a writer. I love writing. And if journalism was going to be my avenue to become a professional writer, then so be it. That's I, I saw it as a means to an end. Sports journalism was sort of an extension of that. Well, I liked all these different sports. I had sort of this experience and knowledge within sports. So why not start my own blog and, and take it from there? So that's sort of how my intro to MMA began. I did the same thing with tennis and with soccer and with all these different uh, sports. But MMA is the one that really took off for me. I ended up joining Bloody Elbow in 2014, just as a staff writer at the time. And it, almost exactly at the same time, uh, I got an opportunity to go... And that in itself is a long story, but to sum it up, I got an opportunity to go become a, a English commentator for a Russian MMA organization called M1 Global. So f between 2014 and 2016, apart from just, you know, building my sort of base as a staff writer for Bloody Elbow, I was doing these trips back and forth to Russia almost once a month between Russia, Azerbaijan, Georgia. And when, when we talk about Russia, it wasn't just St. Petersburg and Moscow. I was going all over the place, including the North Caucasus to places like Ingushetia, uh, which is right, right next to Chechnya. And of course, that kind of exposure opens you up to a whole side of the world that I didn't, I didn't even know existed at the time. And that sort of leads us down this path of understanding, you know, the influence of oligarchs in, in sports in Russia, uh, the role of corruption, the role of the mafias, you know, what, what, and beyond that, this sort of rise of these, you know, dictators and warlords and strongmen figures trying to utilize sports for political gain. And really around 2015, while I was in Russia, it was brought to my attention that there was a dictator in Chechnya who was starting his own fight club. And I thought this was really fascinating. Who is this strange uh, figure who's got this Instagram channel that was really popular at the time with all these videos and montages he was posting of himself? One video could be of him petting a cat. The next video would be him doing a big workout. The third video would be him, you know, firing a bazooka. So uh, it was just the most bizarre, eclectic, ridiculous Instagram channel tied to this figure who also was trying to enter the world of mixed martial arts. So it really felt like a natural entry point for me. Little did I know that it would become sort of one of those stories that shaped my career from then on. Uh, and if this is about the same time, because I was, I covered some sports slash politics stories in Russia around that time as well. And this is kind of the tail end of that era in Russian football where you were getting the same kind of dictators and warlords in the North Caucasus running like Angie Makakshkala and Terek Grozny and, and, and the money kind of suddenly got sucked out of football at that point. Um, in, in Grozny and Chechnya's case, did that, did that kind of immediately just get funneled into MMA? I wouldn't say immediately, but I'd say it was gradual. So you mentioned Tarek Grozny. Tarek Grozny would over the years become be renamed as Ahmed FC. And the reason it was named Ahmed FC is because Ramzan Kadyrov, when he started to invest in sports, Ramzan Kadyrov being this, you know, this dictator, this strongman leader at the helm of Chechnya, a place that he's ruled since 2007 with this iron fist, truly committing some of the most horrific uh, human rights abuses, including purges of sexual minorities, forcible disappearances, torture, you name it, he does it. Uh, so... Part of the things that he was, he was attempting to sort of distract from these human rights abuses was his, by investing in sports, a process known as sports washing. So really at first, before he ever even attempted to start his fight club, he had started investing in football, football being the most popular sport outside of hockey in Russia. So he really just focused that energy on, on, on football, but it wasn't getting anywhere. He didn't really have a strong team. He wasn't going to compete with teams like Zenit, etc. cetera, in, 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 in Russia. So he thought to himself, well, how do I, how do I find a sport that's going to better align itself with my interests in Chechnya? And his interest being, of course, entity uh, elements such as, you know, hyper masculinity, that sort of Chechen machismo that he's been trying to portray. And of course, the, mo the one that made the most sense was combat sports, sort of a mixture between mixed martial arts and boxing. 
So he starts his fight club called Ahmed MMA, Ahmed being the name of his father, Ahmed Kadyrov, who was the first, he, what, he, what Kadyrov calls the first leader of Chechnya. He was actually the person who was at one point a rebel during the Second Chechen War, who switched sides, became a turncoat and switched sides to Vladimir Putin, allowing Putin to win that Second Chechen conflict. Uh, and that since then, Ramzan Kadyrov and Ahmed Kadyrov have been on, on Putin's side. Ahmed Kadyrov was uh, killed in a terrorist attack in 2004 at a football stadium, actually. And in 2007, after consolidating power, Ramzan Kadyrov takes over. Flash, fast forward eight, nine years later, as Kadyrov has sort of cemented his place in Chechnya, he starts investing in sports. That fight club becomes one of those big elements. He starts a mixed martial arts organization, actually hosting his own events in Grozny. And at the same time, he's got these training facilities all across the country where he pays his fighters stipends to simply train and compete uh, for a living. That's it. Their whole job is to simply show up and train, compete, eat, sleep, repeat. That's it. Uh, and this entity sort of grows over the coming years. And that's sort of around the time that I've been in, uh, I was in Russia. I was there in 2015 when he held his first event. And I was there when the fight club was starting. And I was there as we started seeing this trickle in of celebrity figures and, uh, and well-known notable athletes showing up alongside Kadyrov. And really, the list goes on, but to name just a few that your audience would be definitely aware of would be Mike Tyson, you know, and Floyd Mayweather. Those were some really significant names that were showing up very early on uh, to hang out with, with Ramzan Kadyrov. And then there are kickboxing stars like Better Hari. I think we have an endless supply of UFC champions who have gone there past and present. So it, it's really never ending. And I couldn't believe that I had sort of stumbled into this incredible story. And yes, to answer, to finally answer your question, as he sort of continues to expand in mixed martial arts, he sort of completely pushed football to, side, to, to the side. Every once in a while, he'd hold this, you know, big uh, match where he'd bring in people like Ronaldo and Ronaldinho, Ronaldinho, etc., to come and, you know, compete in sort of this showpiece event with him. But uh, other than that, his main focus was always combat sports. I guess it fits the it fits his, what he wants to get out of sport washing right, way better than football. And he doesn't have to bring in foreigners to do the job for him he can kind of grow this groundswell of these sort of hyper macho fighters that are sort of chechen warriors in the in the mold that he would want to show the world i guess i think i think sports washing is a term that's not complex enough to really describe what ramzan kadyrov is doing sports washing is a really limited term that bothers me to an extent i like its popularity i like that everybody knows what it means now but really the term is limited to reputation laundering and that's only one element of what Ramzan Kadyrov is trying to do. I mean, uh, let's put it this way. He is far more interested in sports socialization than he is in sports washing. I don't think Ramzan Kadyrov really cares what you think about his human rights abuses. Truth be told, he doesn't care. He knows he's got the backing of Putin and he's created an environment where you know, if the West hates me, then that's even better for me. So I don't think he's impacted by Human Rights Watch writing, you know, a new list of his uh, of his human rights abuses. What he's interested in is using these sports, these newfound weapons that he has to re-socialize his people after a period of war. What he has gone and done by elevating this new class of athlete to sort of elite status in Chechnya, these fighters, you know, who become members of his inner circle. Uh, by doing so, he's signaling to the rest of the country that this is, you know, this is the ultimate stage that you can be as a Chechen. You want to reach your ultimate, you know, uh, Chechen self, then you'd want to either, you know, fight for me in a cage or fight for me on a battlefield. That's pretty much how Ramzan Kedira views it. That sort of Chechen masculinity, that hyper-masculinity, it's an element he sees that he can really uh, draw out of combat sports. That's just one thing. Like let's let's put the sports socialization aside. More recently, especially since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we have actually seen him go so far as to recruit for his war machine from his fight club. So say there are say there are, you know, he has thousands upon thousands of fighters training in these gyms now. Yet he only has a handful in the UFC and several dozen competing in his in his promotion. So where do the rest go? Where did, the, where did the rest go? The truth is they're being funneled into various different battalions from his private army, which is now currently committing war crimes in Ukraine. So it, it's really insidious on a whole variety of levels, to be honest. Yeah, he's made no 
uh, secret of the fact that he's supporting Putin's war effort in Ukraine, right? He's brought out all of these kind of typically over-the-top videos of guys training and fighting in these camps. And and that, that is coming straight out of the MMA effort, or I guess they, they, they kind of work symbiotically to, 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 to supply fighters and supply troops to the effort then. Oh, it is now... It's very symbolic in the sense that his fight club is merely an extension of his government now. It's it's just the sports arm of Kadyrov's horrific regime. And I guess uh, I was formerly living in Berlin for many, many years, and there's a lot of activity from Chechen either spies hunting down people who are from the LGBTQI movement, uh, or the community rather, um, to bring back to Chechnya to be tortured, detained, possibly even murdered. Um, there's there's been Chechnyan carried out uh, assassinations on German soil um, for the Putin government, uh, and even it's 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 kind of links between organised criminal groups supplying drugs into Europe as well and the Kadyrov regime. So in case people are wondering why am I listening to this on an organised crime podcast, this is all. This is all directly linked, right, to, to the sport and the effort to, to promote uh, Chechnya as a place from, from which these warriors and these people are coming. Absolutely. Uh, Ramzan Kadyrov has really managed to expand his influence beyond his own borders, and he's done that. Uh, you know, he's expanded beyond the Chechen borders to have influence within places like Ingushetia and Dagestan, you know, his neighboring North Caucasus uh, republics, and beyond that into Europe, and far into Western Europe. We've seen this be the case particularly in Austria and in Germany, as you mentioned. The German, the German case I wrote about, I think, in 2017 for Deadspin at the time, uh, talking about the various examples of how he's really showing... Uh, and it doesn't have to, it didn't even have to necessarily be uh, uh, Chechen spies for him to really uh, present himself as an influential figure in Germany. That was one element of it. But on the other element entirely, he simply had, you know, former boxers who were stationed in Germany become sort of his... Uh, his figureheads in those in those areas. And by that, he would end up just, let's say it's Ramadan, for instance, and he did do this during one of the Ramadans. He would gather, uh, you know, poor poor Muslims from whatever community in Berlin, from, you know, ver a variety of, of backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds, but they're Muslims that are fasting for Ramadan. And he'd have them all uh, for an iftar, a big banquet at, at, at sunset. And... Uh, it would be run by this this boxer, this former boxer who was tied to Kadyrov, and uh, everybody would be very thankful to Kadyrov. They'd see they'd see him as sort of this magnanimous leader who is a devout Muslim looking to help other Muslims. So the influence wasn't necessarily just by intimidation, although that was a, a an enormous element of it to say the least. Uh, but he was he, he was applying this influence for all sorts of other you know soft power approaches and propaganda elements such as you know feeding the poor. Really, a, one of the most obvious ways throughout history that we've seen you know. Uh, political machinations take place. So Kadyrov is no different, really. He's doing the same in the Middle East, by the way. He's using sports to expand his relationships in the Middle East. He has done so with Bahrain, he has done so with the United Arab Emirates, and he is doing so with Saudi Arabia. The United Arab Emirates and uh, Bahrain are really interesting cases because both countries have shown interest in combat sports. Uh, in the United Arab Emirates case, and in Abu Dhabi in particular, it's jiu-jitsu, and with uh, Bahrain, Interestingly, Bahrain is also a kingdom with a monarchy. One of its princes, the fifth in line to the, to the throne, uh, his name is Sheikh Khalid bin, bin Hamad al-Khalifa. And Sheikh Khalid decided to copy Ramzan Kadyrov by also starting his own fight club and MMA promotion. And they ended up bonding over these things. So they'd have exchange, fighter exchanges take place. Ramzan Kadyrov ended up visiting Bahrain to watch one of the events in Bahrain. While, you know, the Bahrain team would go visit Chechnya. And this was sort of a diplomatic process. And that's something that Bahrain has been known to do with sports as well. So Ramzan Kadyrov using uh, sports even as an element to his foreign policy strategy. And I think that's very fascinating. It's a multi-pronged approach to not just sports washing, but sports diplomacy and soft power overall. So this sort of influence is something you can expect him to continue to apply until someone attempts to stop him. So MMA is becoming like a sort of English Premier League situation where it's pretty much getting governed by hereditary uh, dictators. 
Well, you know, the, 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 it's even more it's even more problematic because MMA is not as popular. MMA is a sport that's not taken as seriously as, as as football. So at least when it comes to football, it's hard to ignore. The World Cup, everybody was talking about the World Cup in Qatar. Everybody, even if you hated the subject, you knew about it and you were talking about it. MMA is never going to be the same thing. That might have happened one day in history when it was, you know, Conor McGregor versus Khabib or something along those lines, where finally, you know, it's a fight that everybody was thinking about. But MMA is not that sport. And for the most part, what I've been... I've spent years now writing not just for Bloody Elbow, but for The Guardian and The New York Times and all these other legitimate outlets uh, about mixed martial arts and these sort of elements of corruption and the seedy, the seedy underbelly of the sport and the sort of the cesspool of fascism and neo-Nazis and dictators that we're seeing. And for the most part, I get shrugs of, well, what did you expect? They're fighting each other in a cage for a living. That's not a fair uh, analysis at all. I think when yeah. you sort of shrug it off and, and put the put whole sport to the side, you allow it to continue to fester. And what we've seen is that MMA ends up being far more influential than many people initially wanted to accept. And that just doesn't apply just to, you know, far off countries like Russia, assuming, you know, these are Western listeners right now, far off countries like Russia. But think of the United States, think of Donald Trump and the UFC's relationship. Think of how essential the UFC was as a platform for Donald Trump to push his political ideology. I mean, the UFC president, Dana White, spoke spoke at uh, the Republican National Convention twice. He campaigned for Trump over a, a period of multiple years. All this ma- matters. All this factors in. The idea that mixed martial arts is not a... a uh, a worthwhile topic of coverage because it just so happens to have elements of blood sports and cage fighting, I think is just ridiculously short-sighted. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like you say, people write off MMA as, as simply a, a fight in a cage where it's, it's an incredibly, you know, it's an incredibly technical discipline and, and people from all walks of life are getting deep into the sport. It's so popular now. Um, so the, back to Kadarov, I mean, the US government has begun to have a stronger say in sanctioning Kadyrov, various members of his family and his acolytes in Chechnya. Um, what has the UFC and other major major organising groups, what have they done to, to try to counter this? Have they tried? Is any writing on the wall? <laughs> You're laughing as I say this, so I'm assuming not a great deal. <laughs> The UFC has done an excellent job of just sticking its head in the sand like an ostrich and pretending nothing's wrong. The UFC, as far as I'm concerned, and really this has been the case, you know, time and time again, no matter the scandal or the controversy, the UFC is a very reactive organization. They will not accept that they've done something wrong or that something bad is even happening until they're forced to. Until And by forced to, I mean actually face consequences. So most recently, I've written a piece for the New York Times uh, along with my colleague Kevin Draper, covering the fact that the State Department has re- revealed to us that it was aware of the UFC's the UFC fighters' affiliation with Ramzan Kadyrov. Now, this was a big breakthrough step because prior to that, the State Department had not made that clear to us that, that they had specifically been focusing on American fighters uh, from the UFC. Yet. The UFC itself doesn't seem to care. They don't think that they're doing anything wrong. And case in point is the fact that they continue to book fighters from, uh, you know, f- from Kadyrov's own uh, fight club, Ahmed MMA, in UFC bouts. And they do so on U.S. soil. As a matter of fact, it's this level of arrogance that is just, just it blows my mind sometimes. Even from an entity like the UFC, you'd think that when your own government is concerned by the relationships that you may have within the organization, whether or not they are direct or indirect, it's the fact that this is something that has come to the attention of your own government, raising the possibility of sanctions, which means horrific fines if you're ever deemed guilty and the UFC chooses to do nothing about it, well, that shows you the level of incompetence that that organization operates at. I want to say I am surprised, but this is the same organization where the where the president, Dana White, can slap his wife in public and face absolutely no consequences. Yeah. Truth is, it's a morally bankrupt organization and this is basically how they go about the process now. And it's worth mentioning at this point, I'll, I'll put a link to that New York Times story um, with the show as well, because it's a really great sort of summary of what's going on with these links at the moment. Um, and it's worth reminding listeners that the Ahmad MMA gym 
uh, is run by uh, a guy called Abu Zayed Vizmuradov. Vizm- I'm going to get his butcher his name as I do all names, but he's a colonel in Kadyrov's army, and he's also been directly implicated in that regime of bringing LGBTQI Chechens back to the country to be tortured, detained, and and possibly killed. So I mean, these these links are not. Um, tenuous in any way, right? These are these are extremely direct links between the human rights abuses and the crime that's carried out, and and the sport itself. So yeah, I guess you do have a point when you say that sport washing is a little bit too broad a topic or an idea for this. It is unfortunately. I mean, Abu Zaid Vismaradov. When I was when I was in in Russia, going back and forth, the, well, one of the names that kept coming up all the time was Vismaradov, and people never call him Vismaradov. There, he's known by his sort of his nom de guerre, and that's. Uh, that's Patriot. So Patriot, <laughs> okay. and I mean, that goes to show you yeah. the sort of status he has in Chechnya and, and, and sort of the symbol of loyalty toward, to Ramzan Kadyrov. He truly is one of the, and I was always told this, he's one of the most dangerous men in Chechnya, one of the most dangerous, vicious and violent. And the stories I've heard of the torture he's done and, and the elements he's been involved in, Unfortunately, very difficult to prove, but the stories that have come out about him are terrifying, to say the least. This is a man who has been pictured at UFC events, by the way. Pictured, and like, smiling and hugging the UFC's matchmaker, Sean Shelby, as well. I mean, this is not a person who just does, has, just so happens to, you know, stay in Chechnya and doesn't really have any, you know, relationship with the UFC. The UFC might not have known who he was. That's very possible. But at the same time, they gave this person free reign to roam around the arena. Like this wasn't someone who was just in the back of the stands. This is somebody who was at, at you know, had somehow had floor seats <laughs> to this event, and that's just one of many examples. Over the years, they would continue to let Ramzan Kadyrov attend events. The very first UFC event in Moscow, Ramzan Kadyrov was there. You know, one of one of the UFC events on Fight Island in Abu Dhabi, Ramzan Kadyrov was there, <laughs> and the UFC went out of its way to claim that they had nothing to do with it. Yet the question that they were never able to answer to me was, well, why did he have front row seats? <laughs> yeah. You don't just, you're not just able to buy that, you know, you know, somebody must have signed off on him having those front row seats. So, you know, the UFC will, will continue to pretend that it has no relationship with Ramzan Kadyrov, but the truth be told is that this, this fight club that he is responsible for is not just a place that he's, he's attempting to, you know, uh, what, what's the term I'm looking for here? The Fight Club is just not—it's not just like his little hobby. This is this is a, this is a legitimate entity uh, connected to his government, an entity mm. he's used as part of the war machine. And the UFC is just allowing that to happen like it's nothing. There's the countries in like I mean, Russia and Ukraine are at war right now. Yet the UFC has no issues whatsoever allowing not just members of that fight club involved in the war to compete on U.S. soil at the UFC, but at the same time to allow some of its own champions and UFC fighters, Americans, go over to Chechnya to shoot guns at the exact same training facility, the Russian, you know, special forces university and training facility that arms and prepares soldiers to go to war in Ukraine. The level of irony, the ridiculousness of the whole situation is baffling. Yeah. And yet, not a single person has faced consequences. Not a single person has faced consequences yet. And I say that to the U.S. government as well. The U.S. government hasn't seemed to have taken any actions. You know, placing sanctions or, or putting people on a sanctions list is step one of a multi-step process. And they have chosen not to follow through. Let's put it this way. When Tyson Fury was shown to have affiliations with the Daniel Kinahan cartel, Right. What happened immediately? He was immediately placed on a travel travel ban list and could yeah. not enter the United States. Why has that not happened to some of the most significant UFC fighters attached to Ramzan Kadyrov? That's what I'm waiting to hear. The only answer I can think of right now, apart from potential incompetence from the government, is the fact that a lot of these fighters aren't as well known as Tyson Fury. So, again, this is why MMA gets away with so much. It's not as popular, it's not as well-known, and it's not as taken as seriously. Yet its threat on a political scale, it matches any other sport I can think of. But, I mean, talking of in the consequences, intended and unintended, I mean, your work at Bloody Elbow, especially, in, and work for other outlets, it, it causes a huge amount of, of chatter when these stories come out. And some of the shit you cut, I can't, when the stories uh, appear, I mean... <laughs> 
Uh, I- I'm guessing that you must get some pretty uh, wild stuff slipping into your DMs on Twitter and whatnot from reporting this stuff. I can't imagine too many people in Grozny and, and, and Chechnya are happy with, with your work, which is a good thing. Yeah, uh, the, the Twitter stuff doesn't bother me at all, to be honest with you. Uh, Twitter trolls and all that, that's, I mean... Part of the course, I guess. <laughs> that, that easy, yeah. you know, blocking, blocking them is the easiest thing. It's like, you know, swatting flies on a wall. <laughs> you know, it's, it's no big deal and you don't think about them again. But uh, and, and they're nothing in comparison to facing actual legitimate threats on your life or you know, death threats of the like. And just the, the truly nasty... Uh, messages that come from some people with true truly vicious intentions i don't care if somebody's telling me to shut the fuck up or something along those lines that 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 doesn't matter uh, the far more significant ones the ones that ha- that force me to you know uh, ensure that i'm not geolocated at any point that make yeah. me not put up any pictures or you know share any aspect of my life like a normal human being the stuff that made me have to you know hold my wedding at an undisclosed location uh, when i when i married my wife it's elements like that that drain you after a while. But every time I have to stress this one point is that I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm a journalist who does not live in Russia doing this, as we've seen over the last year, just since the invasion, how Russia treats its own uh, journalists. Now imagine any of those journalists and how much more threatened they would be if they were reporting on Ramzan Kadyrov as well on site. We, uh, we already know of several journalists who are likely assassinated by Ramzan Kadyrov and his cronies. And the ones who continue to do that reporting, such as for outlets like the Novaya Gazetia, now those are the real heroes. Mm. They're, they're remarkable. What I happen to do is I happen to have stumbled upon a niche of, you know, this intersection of sports and politics within combat sports and with Ramzan Kadyrov. And it's a story I intend to follow through as far as I possibly can. That's really the extent of that for me. Yeah, and long may it continue because, I mean, yeah, you only have to look at stories coming out of Russia to see how the two regimes just work kind of hand in glove these days. I mean, even more so than a few years ago when the Chechens were running around Moscow killing the likes of Boris Nemtsov. But, um, yeah, I I, I certainly won't geolocate you on this podcast episode. But um, thanks ever so much for joining me, Kareem. I really urge people to go out there and and check out your work. Uh, Where can they find you in case they're looking? Well, you can find me, as you mentioned, at bloodyelbow.com, where it's likely that Bloody Elbow is going to be moving independent uh, uh, post-Vox Media. And apart from that, you can always find my work. I contribute to both The Guardian and The New York Times and for a wide range of other outlets. But in order to keep up with me, you can follow me on Twitter at Zidane Sports. Cool. Well, um, I hope people do that. And uh, I hope to speak to you in the the future about this topic. I think it's something that's going to... I guess it's only going to amplify in the coming years, I would imagine, given the UFC silence. Oh, I have a feeling we have not heard the last of Kadyrov or of this sort of story, unfortunately. I'd like to say that, you know, it's come to an end and I can finally move <laughs> on, but I don't think that time has come just yet, Sean. <laughs> yeah, journalism is uh, usually a losing battle. <laughs> but, um, yeah, well, thanks ever so much, Kareem, and, uh, yeah, hope to speak to you soon.